What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bar, Quest Nutrition, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 creates 100% outsourced VIP special events for software companies or conference organizers. Uh, we have actually helped companies, and what it does is really help get more referrals, increase retention with their highest level customers, and get more engaged new customers. Uh, we do them all over the country. We just did one a few days ago in Chicago. We've done them this past year. I know Dan's a big fan of high-level masterminds too. We did them in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Vegas. You know, So um, if you're interested in bringing your highest value, you're bringing your highest level customers together to connect and collaborate, uh, then go to Rise25. You can email us and see if your community qualifies. So, Dan, I'm really excited. Today we have Dan Metters, co-founder of Wholesale Formula with Eric Lambert. They began selling on Amazon as a hobby with an original investment of only $600. They worked nights. Let's not, that's not a push button, uh, you know, push button solution, right? You, in the beginning, have to actually put in some work so let's not pretend that's not there, right? Work nights and weekends buying products on clearance at local retail stores, selling them on Amazon for a profit. It only took a few months for them to see the potential and they turned the hobby into a business and both left their full-time jobs to sell on Amazon full-time. Since then, they've been able to generate over $20 million in sales on Amazon and they've developed you know, so that actually they don't have to work all the nights and weekends anymore, right? You develop your own unique system take advantage of wholesale opportunities called the wholesale formula and the wholesale formula is the blueprint they use to build their multi-million dollar Amazon business and he hails from Kentucky. Dan, thanks for joining me. Absolutely, Jeremy. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be on here with you, man. Yeah. And so I want to start off in here. Okay. So obviously you're working a full-time job, you're discovering Amazon is a great avenue um, for your business. What were you doing? What was your day job? Uh, yeah, I was actually a chief officer in a uh, local retail internet retail company. Um, so you have an unfair advantage was, already. You already know internet retail. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I mean, we did, we actually didn't sell on Amazon, and okay. um, we we sold on eBay and and, and some other third party platforms. Hmm. But uh, I mean, the bulk of our, our our sales came through our website. And yeah, to be it's honest, it's harder to do. Right. Like, I mean, you learn the hard for, way. What what kind of stuff sure. were you selling? Uh, we were one of the largest toys and games independent mm. retailers uh, in, in the country for, for oh. more niche hobby games like uh, Magic the Gathering and stuff like that. All right. So what was working online then to sell those on your website? Uh, well, I mean, it was we, we had a really strong website, really strong SEO, and, and we're one of the older companies in the space. But it, it was actually – I kind of found that job um, – uh, Almost by accident as well. Like I, my, I originally had intended to be an attorney and was going to law school and got that job in, in the summer and just had a real passion and, and true love for e-commerce because I love the way that the internet connects people and, and allows people to buy things beyond what they can physically get to. Um, so once once I, I got into that role, I, I just truly loved it. And it was a really pa it was a real passion. And then along came Amazon, and you know it started out. You mentioned it. It was six hundred dollar investment, and it was we you know we we didn't want to lose money, but in the same token, we it was something that seemed exciting and fun. So we had to try it out, and that's it. Yeah. That's you know how we got the uh, start with Amazon as well. So why did you initially want to be an attorney? Uh, it's just it, it had something been it was something that was a, a, a kind of a passion of mine. Hmm. Um, I've always I've always enjoyed debate. I, I love um, politics in general. I love I love research and things like that. So a lot of the things that I was good at it, it was uh, it suited me very well. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about your process for your research process and find new products. But um, you started off doing with retail arbitrage. So what hey, were you doing early on? For sure. I, I mean, it was well. I, I'll preface with. We are from Southern Kentucky. You guys can probably tell from my accent, but uh, uh, 
you know, it's not exactly what I would call a hub of commerce. Uh, you know, we have one Walmart, the closest target to my house. I have to drive an hour and a half. Really? Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, while, while we were out shopping in stores, it was very meager here. Um, but uh, ultimately, it, I remember our first little shopping trip. We One of our buddies told us about this business model, and he it kind of explained how it worked and took us out and showed us. Um, and then we just had to do it. So we went out in the store, and we bought a bunch of stuff that kind of fit those those predetermined guidelines we had and sent it in. And to be honest, I literally thought we were throwing money in the garbage because it was like, you know, there's no way people are going to buy this crap. Like it, it was. Just, what were you buying? It, it was a bunch of bunch of to- like uh, little toy Disney cars, but you know they were they were selling in, in Walmart for three dollars, and we were selling them on, or pricing them on Amazon for eighteen dollars. And I was like, there is literally no way anybody's going to buy a small little tiny Disney car for eighteen uh, dollars. But we you know we ended up sending them in and. Holy moly. It was insane. Like just people were buying these things left and right. And and that's when I knew that we had found something that we could really mm. excel at because, uh, you know, there was such a crazy demand on Amazon for even small little products like that. And uh, I mean, me and Eric immediately knew it. And it was uh, it was it was it just became an immediate passion for us. Like we couldn't wait to get our cash out so we could go spend more money and send more stuff into Amazon. How many were you buying up at a time? Like were you just clear the shelf. On those uh, basically, yeah. Like if it fit our predetermined, like we had just had, you know, we didn't have any idea what we were doing. So we had these little predetermined guidelines that Andrew, our, our buddy, had told us about. He was like, hey, you know, if you stay under a, a ten thousand sales rank, you can buy easily up to twenty and, and move through them pretty good. And you know that does that's not very scientific. Like it was just okay. That that's what we'll do. And we just looked for uh, good, well ranked products that that were you know had had good sales ranks. And we were buying, you know, up to 20 and 30 units of those. Hmm. So what was next? You didn't do that. You still don't do that. So you transitioned. For sure. Uh, you know, whenever we got, so whenever we got started, it was, you, you mentioned it, we were working nights, weekends, et cetera. And it was, it was still tiring. Um, but we had a really good December. And I, anybody who's listening to this, I'll go ahead and preface with December is good for everybody. Don't just assume you're doing an amazing job. <laughs> so we were, we did, a, we had a really good December. I think we did thirty or forty thousand dollars in sales. And I, at one point, I was just talking to Eric, and I was like, "Imagine if we were doing this full time, man! Like, how much would we have done?" Mm. And uh, so in January, we went full time, and, and we left our jobs, which was definitely a mistake. Shouldn't have it left was our a mistake <laughs> for sure. I, I mean, it, we just weren't financially ready. Like, we weren't financially ready. Um, and we were still breathing the quarter four high, so to speak. Mm. Like, you know, everybody's everybody's selling more That's what I and- tell people if you're thinking about moving to Chicago, you come in the winter. Exactly. And that's, right? that's and again. That's, that's, you don't make that decision to quit like in December when you're riding high. <laughs> for sure. Because, you know, even if you're doing great, your summer sales are, are, are going to be not generally not as strong as, as, as your quarter four sales. So uh, I feel like we jumped a bit early, but um, I, I think that's. I think that puts people in a in a situation to where you're going to get the best you out of them. You have to make it work too. I mean, right. now your back's against the wall, and you just got to do it. For sure. Was that and, a tough decision? Do you, I mean, I don't know what your family situation was like. If you had to talk to a significant other at the time, or well, that's uh, <laughs> I wouldn't advise this either. I do have you know my wife. Uh, she's wonderful and, and supportive, but I was worried that she would talk me out of it. So I quit before I even talked to her. Like I told her how passionate I was about this business and, you know, it was more of a hobby, but I, I actually gave my notice before I talked to her. Mm. And, and then when I told her, she was like, uh, yeah, you should go take that back immediately. <laughs> like you should, you should go undo this because it's, it seems like a terrible mistake because I had a fantastic job. I mean, I, I, had, I had a well over a six figure salary. Um, and, and you know, I, it was, it was a great job too. I mean, I, I got to travel all the time. I got to work with games and toys and, and cool stuff like that. Um, but it was, it just wasn't, it, it, it wasn't mine. It wasn't something that I was just growing on my own. And that's, that's what I was craving. And that's what, mm-hmm. you know, ultimately Eric was craving too. Yeah. In retrospect, so, what would you have done then? I, I think I probably, I think we probably should have waited pro- about six months. Um, and ultimately I think, I think it was the right decision to leave. I just, I feel like we put ourselves against a wall and I put my family in a, in, in, in a more difficult position than I, I should have. I yeah. should have, I should have, you know, I, I let passion take over rather than, uh, rather than logic, and uh, you know, it did work out. But it, but at the end of the day, I, I, I you know, I, I felt like I, 
uh, took some liberties that I shouldn't have. With, yeah, with, it's with more them. of a risk. So retail arbitrage. What was the next model that you went with? Well, well I mean, when we were doing retail arbitrage, I mean, it was it was great. But like I said, we weren't. It, it's not exactly. There's not a ton of stores here. So you know, when we went full time, I had to replace a pretty significant income. So like it was a lot of work, and you know Eric had a Eric had a great job too. I mean he, he had a they had a very strong salary, as well. Um, so we we drove literally around the country. I mean we were all, we were gone five and six days a week, driving around, picking up inventory, coming back, shipping it. We had spent a day with our families and on the road again, and that lasted for about uh, probably about two years. Wow, that's uh, a long two- time. That's grind. Yep. And, they should have done and, like a reality show instead of Pawn Star or whatever it is. They follow you around the country. They could. I mean, it's it's a wild thing. I mean, it, what was it's the crazy. farthest you went? I mean, we we went to New York. We went to uh, Florida. Uh, we've drove we've drove west wow. to uh, like all. I mean, it, literally, we were traveling. What were you driving all... in? I mean, were you stocking it in your where your your car or? No, we oh. uh, we fairly early on we bought a company van. Um, now it was now this van was was not what I would call a nice van. I mean it was definitely old, beat up, and and eventually we were able to upgrade it into a brand new one of the high top Nissan NVs, and, and that was a that was a big change for us. And that was like in 2013 when we upgraded our van. Um, but yeah, I mean we were just driving around, two dudes in a van, like big white van. <laughs> Coming in, clearing a bunch of shelves, leaving, throwing the stuff in the trunk and er, in the back, and and heading back. Mm. What was your best find? Uh, the, our, I think our biggest uh, money maker was probably Benefiber. What's and that? I, I guess it was twenty, maybe twenty thirteen ish. It's a uh, it's 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 a dietary fiber supplement, hmm. and apparently it is very very. Uh, a lot of a lot of pregnant women love this product hmm. because they, you know they have difficulties using the restroom when they're they're pregnant. Um, and so it, when it, what happened is Novartis had a recall on a lot of other products and it caused them to shut their facilities down for FDA inspection for quite some time. Well, it takes a long time to get back up to speed and that caused a big market shortage on that specific product. Hmm. So you know you could go into Walmart and, and find a product that was selling for nine dollars. And at the height, we were selling those those same bottles on Amazon for ninety dollars. Wow! So did you and, did you know that ahead of time, or how did you figure out that you should be? Were you following that in the in the news? No, uh, huh. it was funny because I scanned one of those items in Walmart and I, I saw it and I was like, wow, you know, this is one of the the because the sales rank was amazing, the profit was amazing, minimal competition, and it was uh, you know there there was obviously something going on with that product. So I talked to Eric about it. And he did a whole bunch of research and, and found out about the, the Vardis issue, mm, which I mean, that actually but that actually opened our eyes to, you know, starting to research with the news. And uh, we, we did hit a few home runs later based on based on that, like with the uh, uh, the little Debbie cakes or, or, or Twinkies, rather. What happened whenever they well, Twinkies, uh, I think they declared bank, bankruptcy yeah. and ended up hostess, getting purchased. Yeah, hostess yeah. declared bankruptcy, yeah. Um, and we were, we were ahead of that and, and made a ton of money with Twinkies because, you know, as soon as Twinkies got announced that they weren't, uh, uh you know, we're going out of business and there was that little bit, I think it was you like a two week window. didn't know if it continue type of thing. Right. That caused prices to spike on Amazon and we made a whole bunch of money with, uh, with Twinkies and ate a whole bunch of Twinkies. So. <laughs> That's not good for your health. <laughs> no, no. Also wouldn't advise eating Twinkies or a whole bunch of them rather. So... You're you're doing this for a couple of years, then what? Well, I mean, ultimately, that that's, that was the problem. Is uh, you know, I have a family. I had I have two kids, mm-hmm. uh, a wife. Eric has four kids now. They, at the time, he had three kids, and uh, you know, it was just it was tough being away so much. You know, but Very we were tough. making great money. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were making great money. We had done you know eight hundred thousand uh, and close to a million the second year, and our profit margins. I mean, that's the thing about retail arbitrage. Your profit margins are amazing. Um, but it is work. I mean, you're physically going out and, and finding your next dollar, right? And if I stop, my sales just go to nothing. Right. That was that was the whole problem with that business model for us, was that when our when we stopped working, our sales went down, and and you know it it was just an endless cycle of of we had we'd made our own business and it was doing well, but we had cre- effectively kind of created a prison for ourselves where yeah. you know we were locked into working for ourselves forever. And that's not what we, you know, that while the money was fine, it, that wasn't what we were looking for when we decided to create our, our own business. It wasn't, I didn't want to make myself a, 
effectively a slave to a slave to the business for the rest mm-hmm. of my life. So we started thinking about other models and what might work for us. And we, you know, we we tried private label, um, and and did did fairly well yeah. with it. Yeah. What are your uh, thoughts on private label? I mean, I think it's a great model. I think it's mm-hmm. uh, you know, for for creative people, um, I, I think you can have a lot of success with it. Um, it wasn't necessarily for us because it was. Uh, you know, while we did have success with it, it was very hands-on. And, it, you know, to oh, me, so. whenever, well, the more hands-on you are with a specific product, like, you know, it, it, t- it took uh, a lot more initial research to find product gaps. Like, you, your research is different and slightly, you know, qu- quite a bit more thorough. Um, beyond yeah. that, you're, you're effectively starting a product uh, from scratch, yeah. and you have to drive no traffic. No one's heard of you. You know, like obviously you go do the ar- retail arbitrage or even wholesale. There's already people looking for that specific product, I imagine. Right? For sure. And that's, you know, that was that was what we ran into. And we weren't great at the time at running advertising. And um, it, it was just it, that process was harder for us than it was for somebody who was a little more uh, marketing savvy, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, so it felt like that, you know, while we were able to stay home more, we were still creating ourselves that same job where we're going to be in, to, in touch with it all the time. So then we started to migrate towards wholesale. And we had a whole bunch of little cool failed business ventures along the way. Like what? Uh, uh, one, of our, one of our more uh, awesome ones was we created a website dedicated to My Little Pony. Um, I have two daughters. And- <laughs> I'm sure they love that. Well, we, we, we were, right, I mean, we were focused on that crowd because not only that, not only is there a lot of um, uh, a fan, a fanfare uh, from the younger younger side, you know, there's there's a lot of fanfare from the older older side as well with really? bronies and things like that, yeah. Um, so why that? So was, why did you decide to do that? Uh, just because, I mean, we had had a lot of success selling My Little Pony products, mm-hmm. and particularly a lot of success selling out-of-print My Little Pony, Pony products. On Amazon, like you would find products that you know had been discontinued and stuff, and you would see them sell for, you know, a, a traditional ten dollar retail product would be selling for fifty or sixty dollars. Mm. So it let us know that it was a very appreciable market, and th- that it had a lot of uh, it had a lot of legs even beyond the print dates. Mm-hmm. So that that was why we focused there, and ultimately that website did fairly well, and we ended up selling it. Um, but it, again, it wasn't for us. It wasn't what we were trying to do. Um, and then we kind of we, we found wholesale and started really working with that. And I, I was a lot more comfortable with that because it uh, it was more similar to the job I had left. So I had a lot of experience working with distributors and uh, uh, you know brands and things like that. Uh, but it was it was very awkward because it, you know Amazon. I think Amazon kind of changed the game a little bit with how brands approach their products being sold. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whenever we whenever I worked at the at the business the, the previous business. It was no problem to get people to sell you product. Like if people actively wanted to sell you product because you represented a new market. So I mean, basically, you know, whenever I would reach out to vendors or, or whatever, and I told them at that business that, that you know we'd love to carry your product, uh, they, they, they were excited. Static. They were basically right. They were beating down our doors because they knew we had, you know, a several hundred thousand person mailing list. We had uh, a website, a PR five website. Like I mean, it, you know, for all intents and purposes, we were their ideal market. Yeah. Um, but it was different. Now you have a little different positioning when you're reaching out to wholesalers. Exactly. And it was funny because we ran into this this issue initially where we would reach out to brands and they would just be like, yeah, you know, man, I appreciate it, but not, not interested. And it's like, Why is that? Why were they saying no? I mean, that, that, was, that was what that completely confused us at first because it's like, why are they turning down my money, right? Like, I'm just trying to buy product. Um, but, but, you know, they, they realize a lot of brands, even then were starting to realize that they had saturation on Amazon, right? That there are already people selling my product. Like all I'm doing is introducing more risk into that environment by letting you sell it. Like you rep- effectively, you represent risk, right? Mm-hmm. Because they, you're not, if you're not increasing sales and then you're, you're, you're at best, you're insignificant and at worst you cause problems. So I, you know, in retrospect, it made a lot of sense to, to why they didn't want to work with us. And then. Uh, so we, we focused initially with distributors and when it went to trade shows. Um, and that worked out completely horribly for us, to be honest. Really? Yeah. Were you absolutely. focused in what you knew in, for, in terms of the toys or, or what? Awkwardly enough, we actually tried to go away from toys because, uh, number one, we wanted to kind of learn how to do wholesale from a new perspective. 
Uh, but more importantly, uh, we wanted to get away from the seasonality because like if you looked at our uh, a graph of our sales in previous years, yeah. more than 50 percent of our sales were coming in November and December. And, and, you know, whenever we started talking about that, it was like, you know, that's that's it's great, a lot. but it's kind of scary. Yeah. Like when you think about it, like what happens if our account would have been suspended or something in that period, like that would have crippled us. So we wanted to move a little bit uh, away from as much seasonality. And so we were focusing on. Uh, more more on health and personal care, to be honest, because mm-hmm. we realized uh, it, our, our initial thoughts with health health and personal care was that it's a replenishable product that people, you know, it, 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 we, we, orig- right, we originally re- we originally thought of uh, replenishable only as consumable. But eventually that, that kind of changed our mind. Like, you know, the dynamic of Amazon is that effectively everything is replenishable, right? Because if I, you know, while if I'm selling garbage cans, for example, while I may not sell a garbage can to the same person over and over and over, there is always somebody wanting to buy garbage cans, and you you can look at a graph and see that that demand literally always exists. Like within, you know, within, you know, twenty five, five within five percent, you know, twenty, thirty, forty sales a month. Like pretty stati- you know, pretty much those those products will sell consistently year round. And, and once we re- once we realize that. Uh, that that kind of changed our mindset towards what we considered replenishable and how we approach products in general. So why trade shows not work? I would just, expect they would work actually, because you know you're you're shaking someone's hand, you're in front of them. This is a real person. Sure, but yeah. uh, well, I mean that was one of the reasons it didn't work is it cuts you short on research, right? Like you're trying to make decisions more on the spot, and that's not where we wanted to be. Um, and, you know, I. I I'm not. I'm not great at that. Like I, I like doing research. I like uh, trying to come up with the right answer. Um, but beyond that, I mean, it's we, we're introverts. Uh, awkwardly enough, I mean, you know, we're sitting here talking, but in a in a, in a large crowd, I mean, I feel awkward. Like I don't. Yeah. I don't. I, I'm not really comfortable talking to people. I think a lot of people um, are. Yeah. For sure. And uh, so that that definitely didn't. You know, being there shaking it didn't hands, like play to your strengths. Exactly. And even, you know, it was just one of those things where uh, we, you know, we did go and then we had this other thing where it's like, you know, all the products that we're looking at were pretty lukewarm. It wasn't, there was no home runs necessarily. And that's, that's just, you know, part of what we were, you know, looking at as opposed to what was there. Cause you go to one of those trade shows like an ASD and I mean, you literally can't go to every booth. It's just not, it's, uh, it's I almost walked ASD possible. for an hour and I think I hit like a very small, tiny corner of ASD. For sure. And, and if you're doing any kind of due diligence and, and stuff like that, you just can't. So, I mean, you know, that was part of what we, the products that we were looking at and what kind of drew our attention. But everything was, was fairly lukewarm. But we, what, what I realized when we were out there, and, and this was our mistake. This is the mistake, and I would caution people if they ever get into this type of business, to not do this. And it was, uh, you know, I, we were out there after that first day. I was like, I was like, Eric, man, we got to, like, you know, we've racked up a bunch of bills being here. We've got to spend some money. Like, even though we're not finding stuff, I mean, it's got to be a concentrated effort to find product. And that's actually the, the definite wrong mindset that you want is to feel like you have to make purchases. Mm. Because then you're you're, you're looking yeah. at deals uh, through, you know, colored glasses, so to speak. And uh, so what ended up happening is we ended up buying a bunch of products that looked pretty decent at the time. By the time we got home, they were literally all crushed because everybody else is buying those products too, right? right? And and that's the that's the dynamic is is whenever you're dealing with distributors and, and traditional wholesalers, is that you know they they just want business they just want to move units they don't care really who they're selling to I mean you know the only thing that makes me different from you is how much I'm spending, like if you're spending more you're a better customer if I'm spending more I'm a better customer, and, and you know it was so frustrating when we got back because it, we we get back and we're like gosh you know all this money spent now we're just dead like. And so we, we just went ahead and sold through it, and, and we're just continuing to plot along. And and we got pretty discouraged, to be honest with you. And it was, uh, you know, this was in 2014, and, and I was like, I'll be honest, man, I don't know how anybody makes any money doing this. Like, right. And, and it was funny because I was literally looking. This is this is the moment that it kind of all clicked for us and changed. And I was l- looking at a product on on Amazon, and I was like, I, you know, I go through and I, I order these, I, I call these distributors, and I get these stupid catalogs. And I, you know, I'm, I just can't find anything. Like I find one product if I'm lucky, and I spend hours and hours and hours and hours, and it just feels like wholesale arbitrage. It, it, that's what it felt like. It is you know, I was just effectively leafing through somebody's store. If I, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, as, as, instead as of doing it in the store, you're doing it online. Right. right? 
and, and I was like, you know, this this to be honest, it sucks. Like it, it's just we we've traded one one prison cell for the next one. And I was I was looking at that product on the screen, and I was like, why can't I just carry that product? Like that's the difference. Is I just want to carry that product. I don't want to go looking to see what people have. I just want to carry that one. Why can't I do that? And you know, we were sitting there, and I was like, hell, let's just let's call them. Let's let's call that company and see if we can carry that product. And you know, that seems like a a very logical thing, right? But all the trainings and all the stuff we were looking at up on on wholesale told you to go through distributors or told you to, you know, uh, go through uh, brand reps and all this other stuff. And, and it's you know that that wasn't working for us. Objectively, it was not working. It was it was causing our business to fail. But we called. So I called this brand and I, I was talking to them and, um, you know, they told me that it's like you know we're already working with several with several Amazon sellers. We're not really interested in, in working with anybody else. And I was like, oh, man, this is so frustrating. And why won't they just do business with us? Right. And you know what the end. But but then we you know when we started putting it in context and thinking about it because we're really stubborn people. I mean that's for for better or for worse we are very stubborn. And uh, I was talking to Eric and I was it was like you know it's it's just frustrating that they won't deal with us and I don't know why like I can't and so then we started asking why like oh, why don't you want to work with us. And then it's just like, oh, you know, you guys, uh, if, if we work with you, you're just another seller. You're just another seller selling our product on that same listing. And it doesn't increase our sales, doesn't really do anything. Uh, you know, it's just there's no reason to have you as a seller. You're taking business away from already from our sellers who've carried our who've carried our product for, you know, up to years. Yeah. And I was like, when you think about it, we were we were. And, and that's whenever we kind of changed our dynamic. And, and it was we we, we went from thinking our, our model of thinking changed to you know the people who aren't actively helping these aren't acting actively helping these brands are really just hurting them and so our mindset changed from how can i help help them beyond giving them money and that became the basis for our mm -hmm. entire business like mm -hmm. that became the basis for eventually the wholesale formula was how can i make myself useful to companies or people without spending money with them mm -hmm. so so, you know, to put that into practice, so to speak, um, the next brand I called, I, I talked to them and they did also didn't want to work with us. And I was like, hey, like, you know, realistically, you should want to work with us because I, I would, I'd be happy to update your listing. Like, uh, you know, look at your look at your description. It is actually terrible. I mean, it doesn't even have one. And then look, let's look at one of your competitors. Mm. And they're like, oh, wow, you know, I, I would love to get that fixed. And it's like, if you just work with me, man, I'd, I'd be happy to fix it for you. And it'll take me 10 minutes and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you and we'll, we'll, we'll nail down the copy and everything. And that brand wanted to work with us immediately. And it was mm. that, that was like the, the, you know, the real light bulb moment of if we help people, uh, they want to work with us. And, and, you know, whenever you think about it in terms of and that just makes sense. I mean, it's, it's, it's reciprocity in the truest form. Yeah. You add value to them and they want to work with you. Totally. Um, Talk about the research project, you know, the process of the research, because, you know, this is your skill set. This is your sweet spot. You like doing the research. You do a ton of research, probably more than the normal person. So you probably reject, who knows, like 49 products and you choose one out of the 50. So. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, it, once once we kind of had that nailed down, right, and, and we realized that wow, people really, really will work with us. We just need to be able to help them out beyond just placing an order. So once we realized that, like we started looking for products that we thought could use our help. And this was really, really hard at first because initially, you know, when you're coming particularly from the retail arbitrage background, the products you typically see or pay attention to are the ones you buy in store, right? Well, those products like Hasbro, they don't need my help. Nike, they don't need my help. Like if I make a listing better and and uh, you know it increases right. the sales three hundred percent, they don't care. Like that is literally not even noticeable to those brands. So then we started thinking about who can I actually help, and it's you know you're effectively developing your avatar, right? It's like who could benefit from this? Who's going to want to work with me because I can help them? So we started isolating down to you know, small to mid-sized companies, and that was what we were doing. Is we started looking for small to mid-sized companies with products that sold well. And that we that had issues with their products that we could thought we could help them with. Mm. The question probably always comes up, Dan, which is what tools do you like? What softwares do you use? Because I'm sure manually you don't go through 
you know, thousands and tens of thousands of pages to, to sure. find it. Um, what do you like to use? You know, and that, uh, this is, this is uh, I think a lot of people will uh, will be shocked by this, but we ran our, when we, when we started this business, uh, uh, particularly the wholesale side, we actually ran it uh, without software until we were doing 100000 a month. Hmm. Um, and, and, you know, that's, I, th- I think that's impressive. Like the, that, that it's cave that, you know, with this type of model that you're able to do that. Now, I, pro- I don't think that's it's just because you had a strict actually. criteria or why is that? Right. It, that, that was it is, you know, all, you know, a lot of what we teach and stuff is the manual base that we used and then uh, we've accentuated it with software and, and they and made it better since then. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, you know, the software that we, the software that we use for research is uh, jungle scout. Mm hmm. And Jungle Scout is just one of those softwares that kind of helps you cull through listings faster and and filter by the criteria you're looking for. So it just takes those um, it takes those same criteria that we are already using and, and kind of but it adds steroids to the mix because mm-hmm. you're able to go through so much faster and, and kind of find what you're looking for. Any other softwares or tools that you like? Over the course of yeah, over the course of time, I mean, we've had to have we've had to add stuff to facilitate it in our business. But my suggestion for people is always to not add a soft don't don't, don't add a software to, to fix a problem that you don't have hmm. so like while softwares work in my business they may not work in your business mm-hmm. because you may not be at that same point but like now we use restock pro for inventory management and, and they you know that 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 software does a fantastic job but we have hundreds and hundreds of products that we have to keep track of without right. something like that it would be very very difficult um uh, but you know, in the early stages, you, you don't need something to keep track of inventory management because you have three SKUs or four SKUs or something like that. Um, another software we use is a repricer. Um, we 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 currently use App Eagle, and, and that's just to keep our prices in line with competition. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's again because we have hundreds and hundreds of SKUs that we need to to focus on at one time, and it would be very very hard and, and actually cost ineff- ineffective to do that with a person as opposed to a software. Um, so, so that's the thing is, is we, you know, with our software decisions, we just look for uh, situations in our business where uh, a software replacement would make it more efficient and uh, more cost effective. Dan, what, um, what are some of those baseline criteria people should be considering when they're looking at, I mean, whatever, it could be um, wholesale, it could be private label. Sure. Uh, well, with private label, I, I, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm probably not the best guy to give advice on that. Like we, you know, we did have some success with it, but I've, I've literally not done it in, uh, since 2014. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've, we've been hardcore wholesale okay. since July of 2014 and, and we're completely full-time wholesale as of January, 2015. Um, but, uh, with, with wholesale, I mean, the, the, the criteria, the, the base criteria of what we're looking for is we are looking for products that sell more than 40 times a month. And the reason we want that is we want there to be sustained existing demand. And, and you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to ever send product because that was the thing is we came at this from a perspective of $600, right? So it's, you know, cash flow has always been an issue for us. Well, that's, that's always the most important thing in our business is making sure that our, our inventory turn rates are in line and that we're getting our cash back out and they are able to reinvest over and over and over and over. Like it, maybe if you're a, a lot cash heavier, you can you can do more investment and stuff like that, and, and build products. But our our focus has always been on uh, just realizing a quick ROI and, and reinvesting our cash. Um, so uh, you know we want products that sell more than forty times a month because I can't think of anything worse than having a product sitting there and not selling because that's money. I mean that's money literally out of cash flow, and that takes away your ability to. Use the things that, that you're good at. You know, like we're good at research. We're good at making uh, purchasing decisions. So I want to increase my uh, increase the the, op- the amount of times that I'm able to do that. Uh, so that's, that's the first criteria. The second criteria is not sold by Amazon. Now, the reason that we don't we we just don't want to compete with Amazon. Uh, it's it's not that you can't win. I mean, you can, absolutely can. Uh, it's not that uh you know that uh, you can't sell products if Amazon's on the list, and you absolutely can. But Amazon doesn't share the buy box the same way. Mm. Like Amazon, they're not uh, playing fairly with the buy box. Exactly, and it's you know sometimes you may get an equitable share of the buy box, and other times you may get one yeah. percent. And and it's you not know, predictable. It's just, right, and and who builds a business? Who says you know what today I'm going to flip a whole bunch of coins and that's how I'm going to run my business? And when we were thinking about it in that perspective, is like you know there's a lot of great opportunities, but it comes at the opportunity cost of 
at being unpredictable. So we focused on reliable cash flow in our business, and, and that was why we didn't want to compete with Amazon. And then the third criteria that we use, and it's, you know, the the, thir- the the base criteria is that the product has more than three sellers. And more than three. I'm thinking like, wow, right? Exactly. And, and you know, a lot of people would think, wow, why, why would you just not want the product that has one seller, so you're only competing against one person? Um, and and it's, so it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive. Definitely. Criteria, is. Right? But the logic behind it is that typically whenever there's one seller on a product, that means it's likely a private label product or it's likely an existing exclusive for someone else. Mm. So, uh, you know, can you convert those products? You may be kind of running up a dead end if, you, if you're doing research on that. Exactly. If, if and that's it. it. I mean, can you convert those? Absolutely. You can definitely convert those. But the opportunity cost on converting one of those is significantly higher than working with uh, an existing listing with three sellers or more and, and just providing value there. So, again, everything for us is it's built around opportunity cost and efficiency because our goal is to have a small – uh, a small uh, a small team. I mean, we don't want a gigantic team of people. We want a small team of really efficient people that uh, that, that don't have to walk each all over each other to do a bunch of work. Dan, are there ever cases where you do ask for exclusives on Amazon? Uh, or no? Yes, uh, yes, but it's 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 more of we let those things we let those opportunities come to us hmm. because here's here's the way I look at exclusives and, and and you know a lot of people want to reach out and they're like hey you know I'd love to be your exclusive seller well everybody right. who contacts them would love to be their exclusive seller just like any beautiful woman walking down the street is not you know you you don't walk up to her and say will you marry me because you know that's that's not how it works right there there has to be some level of introduction some level of familiarity and i want them to see how valuable i am i want them to want to work with me i don't want to i I never want it to be an obligation to work with me i want people to be excited about it because that's how that's how change is made i mean that's how growth is realized right is is both of us are excited and invested into a project it's going to be much likely more likely to succeed than not so uh, the partners that we're looking for those types of relationships um, uh, tend to materialize over time. Mm-hmm. You know, right now I think we have eight or nine exclusives, uh, and we work very closely with those with those brands. But it was all it, th- all of those all of those you built that over time, started. right? And it was just you know over time we would do work that would help them and help their brand and help promote them, and and they got to see that you know we were a great partner to deal with, and then they wanted to work more closely and more closely, and eventually uh, just exclusive. And that's that's the, you know we we're very non-aggressive and going for exclusives uh, because we want true partnerships to 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 grow stan i definitely see advantages with the wholesale side um i want to talk about some of the challenges but advantages i want you to tell me what other advantages there are obviously it's a known product you have a known kind of sales velocity you can kind of see what's selling are there any what are the other advantages um, I mean, it's kind of vetted out. Like you kind of, it's more of a predictable um, piece than, you know, whether it's, you know, private label or something like that. Are there other advantages that you For see? Certain. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the things, is, it, it's a, you know, because we, it, initially we didn't have a ton of money to lose. Um, it, it's a very safe model. Like that's the thing is when you're investing in products that are already selling well, like the the variable in this is price, Right. Like worst case scenario tend to be because, you know, when you start talking about buying and distribution, it's different than buying in retail. When you're buying in retail, maybe in Chicago, there was a big sale this weekend and you got 50 percent off on a product. As a retail arbitrage seller, I can't compete with you. Right. Right. I mean, I just get crushed. Now, with wholesale, it's very, very unlikely that your price is much different than mine. Like even if you're a very big seller, like you're talking uh, you're talking micro percentage points. Right. Like you might have got a five percent better price. Or, or, you know, 10% tops. Like, that's how it works. I mean, there's just not, you know, it, it, wholesale is about efficiency, not uh, not in, in, in over, over discounting. Um, because they want to preserve the price of their products. So whenever, you, you know, from that perspective, it's uh, our, our focus has always been on trying to make sure that we are, uh, we are investing in those types of products that, uh, you know, sell well and, and, and carry as much margin as they can. So, I think I got away from your, your question. A no, little. it was just the advantages, right? It's, it's like oh, it's, it's safe, as, you know. It, like you were saying, it's, it's not as risky because kind of there's right, a, more of a level playing field there. Exactly. I mean, the worst case scenario, you tend you tend to lose 
uh, five or ten percent on a product, and then your money's out of it. And that's what I'm talking about with cash flow. Is once my money's out of it, if I lost five or ten percent on that line, and I, I realize it's going to be inconsistent, I just never invest in it again, and I find a better a better product. But my money's only dead for for basically thirty days because we don't invest a lot into products either. We focus on replenishing our products as opposed to going deep. So we carry a thirty day supply of products or forty five day supply of products tops. So it's a it's pretty yeah. minimal investment, and that's I think that's one of the major advantages. And another major advantage is our uh, is that our products are ninety nine percent sourced domestically. So our speed to market is very very fast. Like I place an order today, uh, may it, it's going to take them two to three days to ship that, um, and, and you know that lands with uh, our prep center or, or warehouse, and then that sh- that product is shipped onto Amazon, and you're live in Amazon within a week. So I mean, uh, you know, the the dead period for my money is, is again reduced, and that's you know, uh, cash flow has always really been been a, a really big part of what we do. Uh, so having dead periods of, of I've paid out money and I'm waiting on product wasn't a good idea for us. Um, and then another, it, it, you touched on it earlier, was was the predictability. Is you know, I'm not having to build, uh, I'm not having to build sales rank, I'm not having to build traffic and and things like that. Instead, I'm literally able to take a great selling product and just make it slightly better, right? So, I mean, it, predictability, I can almost look at it. And if I'm, you know, if I use a, a, a service like Keepa or, you know, that's free. You can look, look at a graph and you can see the consistency in price. So, I mean, if that price has been really consistent for a long period of time, like I can literally almost look at it and just tell you what my monthly return is. Like, you know, I'm going to invest $1,000 into this product and I'm going to make $250 profit or, or $300 profit every month. And that's, you know, that, that that's what wholesale is. It's it's not about home runs. It's about tons and tons of of singles. And, and you know, whenever people always ask us about our business, it's 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 the most consistent business. Like we don't try to teach people how to hit grand slams because I think that's more of a right place, right time situation. Yeah. Uh, we teach people how to build sustainable businesses that are just built on, you know, cash in and cash out consistently month in and month out. Yeah. So I want to talk about some of the challenges. One, obviously. You talked about early on, which was challenging, was finding product, right? You have a certain sure. criteria. So, I mean, if you have a criteria and you use a software, that that can be overcome. But um, I'm sure that's one thing. And then the other, maybe, I don't know if you talk about it. Um, obviously, you're competing at a certain level, a little pricing, buy box. I don't know. How does that factor in as a challenge for someone who's doing wholesale? Sure. And this is this is a big tip for people. Whenever you're applying to wholesale accounts, like this was a, you know, this is effectively what the wholesale formula was, right? It was our our our, our methodology for starting to and developing relationships with vendors, right? Like wholesale as a as a concept, it's really easy. I mean, it's buy things uh, at at wholesale price and sell them for retail price and and realize that profit. But uh, you know, the, the 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 necessity in our business for uh, the wholesale formula and all it is is it's just a blueprint of our business. It's it's what we do day in and day out. Um, was that these these companies de- didn't necessarily want to work with us, right? And that was the, one of the biggest challenges was was trying to get companies to work with us and and, and realizing strategies to to aid that. Um, you know that 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 was honestly that that's been one of the bigger challenges. Now, as far as like as far as pricing and and things like that, like uh, with the buy box and variable price, we tend to what what we've noticed is. That whenever you work with brands that just say yes to everybody, like if you call them and you're like, hey, I'd love to work with you. And you're like, yeah, man, let me go ahead and open you an account. Like, here's our catalog. Here's our price list. Like, there you go. What we noticed is over time, those products go down. They get crushed. Right. Like, because there gets so much, there's so much competition on it, right? Like, if they're telling me yes, like, while I would love to believe that I'm special, I know that they're telling you yes. And I know that they're telling the other 10 people who call them that day yes, Right. And if anybody can make money, that's what they're doing. They're just buying that product and shipping it on in. And over time, people try to get more and more of the buy box, or their sales decrease because there's more competition. They're and you start to down. see that. Yeah. You start to see that price degrade. So the brands that tend to work out for us long term are the ones. Whenever we call them, and they say, "No, man, we're not interested in working with you. Like we've already got representation on Amazon. Like that's exciting. It's more exciting that's to be you told want to no." Work with. Yeah, because I, I realized, you know, it, originally, I'll be honest with you, whenever that we would hear that answer, it was just, ah, oh, man, like, this is terrible, you know, time to call somebody else. But now it's whenever we hear that, it's yes, like we get excited because we know that everybody hears that answer. And while it while, you know, it's not as, you know, you don't it's always turn to around. entry. Yeah. 
Right. I mean, that's that's the that's the you know the meat and potatoes of it is there there is now a barrier to entry, and then whenever you know they're they're declining me, they're declining everybody. It's nothing personal. So if I can convert that person, now it's harder. I'll, I'll, I'll preface with it is much harder to convert that person who told you no than it is to just go find more people that say yes. But when you convert them, you know they're telling everybody else no too. So that product stays good for a long period of time. And, and you know, that that's we have we carry a lot of the same products that we carried in twenty fourteen. And it's you know that that's what's made our business grow is effectively it's you take an existing level of sales and you just add accounts to it and, and you grow over time. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, you know, now you think of it in the opposite respect when you get the rejections. Exactly. I mean it's 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 an opportunity. Dan, what um I've heard the term branded wholesale. How does that differ from regular wholesale? Well, I mean, with branded wholesale is, you know, that's that's more of what we do is we, uh, you know, we don't deal with uh, unbranded products or Got more generic style products. Okay. I, uh, I guess I was thinking like customization, like you were adding customization to the already branded wholesale, but that's not correct. Um, well, typically, I mean, in it, you know, I think I think a lot of these definitions are, are more superfluous, but yeah. Uh, and what that means to me is more of like your generic products that are being purchased from like an Alibaba or something like that. Mm, and again, it's it. just whenever you're doing that, you're not building real relationships. And that's why we tend to steer clear of it. Totally. So process for launching, man. So you talk a little about the research, the criteria. What's your process for? OK, you got it. Well, I mean, that's the beautiful part, right? Like that's that's what makes this work is once they say yes, my process for going live and starting to make money is immediate. Like I don't have to do anything to get this product off the ground. It's product. The product's already selling incredibly well. So whenever I send in that first order, I'm already realizing sales. As long as I'm competitive, you know, sales are happening. And a lot of the companies we work with have map pricing and, and things like that. And mm-hmm. what map pricing is is it's you know minimum advertised price. The retailers that they work with, they want them to sell that to sell it at this price or higher. So you don't tend to see a lot of those races to the bottom. And you know, a lot of the companies we work with don't want to work with a ton of sellers because. Uh, you know, we're we're able to help them meet those needs. Favorite, so, favorite story from someone going through the wholesale formula? Oh, there's so many, man. Like, it, it's honestly we have we have we've had we've been fortunate. We've had uh, a lot of success stories within our community. Um, what surprised and, you from someone who got something different out of your formula from maybe what it was intended? There's any well, I mean, use, that's, use cases that you know they're you know sometimes the students teach you something of what you didn't realize from going through your own materials. Is there one of those where you learned from feedback you were getting from a student going through it, and they kind of uh, added some a layer on? For sure, uh, for what it's worth, like that's uh, that's the most valuable part of the wholesale formula for us is that we've added you know we've added over twenty five hundred really really smart people to that community that have, have, have went through our course and uh, been, been successful. And it's you, when you add that many smart people into the mix and they start to talk about, you know, how what's working for them, like our core, like if you looked at our course from day one for, and you know, it was a direct representation of our model then. And you look at it now, it is literally not even, I don't even know if there's a video. I don't even know if there's a one video that's the same. And it's our, our model has continued to evolve with our community and then with their help. You know, like you'd asked about a success story, and, and one of the mo- a couple of the really impressive ones that just come to mind are, uh, you know, we have one of our really good friends, Emmerich Manello. Uh, he moved to the United States, uh, I think, in, in about 2011, and he, he was he's a French guy, and uh, he didn't speak any English, so it was like really really difficult for him to get started. And whenever he lived in France, he was a web developer, mm-hmm. but whenever he moved to the United States, he moved to Las Vegas because he was playing poker. And, uh, you know, that was uh, he didn't have to talk and it was just something he could do. And that's how he learned to speak English was at the poker table. And then, uh, you know, he took our course in uh, January of 2015. And, you know, he had a really, really small Amazon business at the time. Like he had been doing retail arbitrage and was, you know, doing two to two to five thousand dollars a month in sales or something. And uh, within six months, he at that point, he was already he was working as a web developer for UNLV and. He was able to leave his job. He bought a new house, and uh, uh, you know he's, that's that's his whole business now. His whole business is um, is Amazon wholesale, 
and uh, and, and a lot of that was you know he took what we had and he introduced his own flair into it. And that's that's what we always tell people is you know the most successful business you can build is just taking a great concept and, and adding your your personal flair into it or what makes you unique. And and that was what he did is he added that to it. And then we had another lady who uh, she had a really tough uh, really tough situation. You know she was a single mom. Um, she she was on assistance and uh, government assistance. And she took our course, and she said it was literally she had to borrow money uh, from her family to get her first to start whenever she started scouting and, and sourcing inventory. And uh, now she is uh, she. Oh, I mean, within within a year, she was doing over thirty thousand dollars a month in sales consistently, and uh, is just now has a, a real business. I mean, her business is she has a lot. All all of, most of the majority of her accounts are exclusives or semi exclusives, and it's because she's in a niche, right? And and one of it, this is the thing that I love about it is it, 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 people get to bring their outside passion into it and it just accentuates it. Um, with her, you know, uh, one of her big things was she had a lot of trouble getting pregnant. And she always wanted to be a mother, mm. and to the point that she did so much research on um, uh, fertility that she became a, a fertility practitioner. Mm. Like she 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 picked up her uh, certifications Becoming and, and necessary. It. Right. And you know now all the products that she sells on Amazon are related to her fertility practice, and um, you know it's 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 turned into, she said it has literally changed every part and aspect of her life, mm. and, and that's that's the kind of thing that's that, fulfilling, right? I mean that's 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 exactly what we're looking for in that community and what we love to hear. Dan, first of all, thank you. This has been really informative. Love it. Um, Two last questions I always ask since it's Inspired Insider. I ask sure. what's been a proud moment and then what's been a uh, difficult time that you had to push through. Um, what's been a difficult time in the journey? Uh, you know, to be honest, it's, it's – I don't think – I don't I, – I'm one of the odd people. Like we've obviously had a whole lot of difficult times. I try not to dwell on it. I always try to be one of the people that look forward. Um, so I have I, I can't talk about it from like a perspective of, of, you know, this catastrophe happened because I don't look at it in terms of catastrophes. It's, it's like I look at it in terms of things we've learned from. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, one of the biggest ones that we learned from was that and this was what drove us to, to really wanting relationships uh, with with our vendors is uh, it was, I guess, it was mid. It was more towards the beginning of when we started our wholesale journey. Uh, we thought we found an amazing deal, and we literally invested every dollar we had into it hmm. and got crushed, wow. like absolutely crushed. Products when we bought them, uh, by the time we received them, were literally selling for less on Amazon than we paid, and you start factoring in fees. I mean, we were destroyed. And, uh, that, that puts you to the test right there. Like it was every dollar we had. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things where we had to come up with a creative solution and we started working with other folks, um, and, and started reaching out to other people who, within that industry uh, of the products that we were carrying. And I was able to find a liquidator who did the, you know, they couldn't pay us enough cash to get us out of the jam, but we were able to trade that product for a, a dil- more diluted version because we had literally thousands and thousands of this one SKU. And I was able to trade my thousands and thousands of that one SKU, uh, one, one bad product for, you know, 50 of this and a hundred of that and 20 of this. And, and, you know, that was able to dilute it enough that we were able to sell through and start recouping enough cash to get back on our feet and, and really move forward. Hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. That's sometimes the, the, the learnings that, you know, really help other people when they're, well, I mean, they're experiencing uh, that. And, I, you know, this is one of the things we always tell our students is, is the best lessons hurt a little bit. And, and that's, you know, and it's it's unfortunate that it has to happen like that. But, you know, it's 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 a lot of people uh, just don't learn from success, right? I mean, it's just they, they accept success and it just happens. But you you always get to the point whenever something hurts that you learn from it. And it's if, if nothing else, it's a survival instinct. I don't want this pain again. I don't want to go through this again. And you start looking at all the factors that went into the, what got you there. And that's ultimately that whole process helped us so much with our research. And it helped us realize the uh, the absolute importance of building relationships. Because you know that doesn't happen now. And it doesn't happen because 
the the companies I work with, I, I know how where their products going, and I, you know, and they I, they legitimately want me to be a part of their team. So it, there's there's not the same kind of surprises that we ran into with that situation. Mm-hmm. Thanks for sharing that. What about on the flip side, Dan? Uh, proud moment from um, the business. Honestly, uh, the 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 proud moments for us have been. Uh, the most the, the most proud moment was the first time we went to uh, Las Vegas and, uh, and you know with our with the TWF uh, the the wholesale formula and we went to a dinner and getting to meet the people for the first time made it so real hmm. that it's like you talk to these people online and you know yeah. it's 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 great that you hear about their success and stuff like that but whenever you get to literally talk to somebody and and hug them and they tell you that what you did literally changed their life uh, and you know I, I remember the the most vivid conversation I, I had was with a with one of our uh, awesome ladies in our community uh, Cheryl Brightman and uh, Cheryl came up to came up to me and was just talking about it, it, that first that first dinner we had with them in Vegas and she was talking about the struggles of her business and I, I was giving her some advice and next time I saw Cheryl like she was crying and she said, it, you know, she was bawling and she said that, you know, all, everything is everything was going well for the first time in a, in a long time for mm. her. And, that you know, she was she had been bordering bankruptcy and uh, it was was doing very well. She has one account right now that generates over two hundred thousand dollars a year in profit. And her business has grown significantly from that point, too. So it's it's just like seeing that change and, and, and what it really means to somebody. Like, you, you know, you read the posts and all that kind of stuff, and it just doesn't have that same uh, gravity that, that it has of, of seeing someone in person and realizing that you really did have an impact on their life. And it, it's just unbelievable feeling, and it's so emotional, like, uh, hmm. that it was easily – by far the, the most satisfying moments for us are, are generally not within our own business, but within the, the wholesale formula community. Totally. Dan, where sh- thank you so much. Where should we point people towards? Where should they check out? Oh, we have our, you know, we have our, our website, the wholesale formula.com. And we have a blog on there that, that helps, uh, you know, our, we, we've invested a little bit differently in our blog. Like we don't try to just shoot articles out for the sake of shooting articles out. Like all of our articles are very, very in depth and, and focused on uh, trying to get people started and trying to get people to understand the model because we truly believe in it. And we truly believe that, uh, that and, and the power it has, you know, the power of entrepreneurship that, that particularly has uh, to change people's lives for the better. And that's, you know, I, I just love being a catalyst for that as much as I can. I want to be the first one to thank you, Dan. Everyone check out whole, the Wholesale Formula, T-H-E, WholesaleFormula.com. Thanks again. Absolutely, brother. Thanks. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.